thank you for being here again. And yes, <laughs> I think it's again again. And uh, yeah, we have a big pleasure to attend the lecture by Atam Hafez today. Uh, yeah, Atam Hafez is uh, uh, actually firstly a performer, choreographer, and uh, regular guest of Cairo House Opera, and uh, artistic director and founder of uh, Haraka, uh, which is a uh, uh, performance and uh, performance research uh, foundation, and uh, is also uh, the director and founder of uh, Trans Dance Festival, and a publication called uh, Chirographia, uh, uh, dedicated to uh, critical theory, critical research, uh, research on performance, so on and so on. And one more thing, one more thing. Finally, we have complete uh, group uh, because uh, actually this night, uh, uh, Zoran Djakovic arrived and uh, Marta Kyle arrived. Finally, which is very nice. Marta Gail is uh, the founder of uh, EPUB and, and the curator and the uh, founder and the initiator of EPUB, Eastern European Performing Arts Platform, uh, an organization, our, our uh, main supporter and uh, partner and supporter, actually, <laughs> without whose help, uh, uh, I guess the seminars would be very, very difficult and maybe impossible to have. So thank you, Marta, and thank you, thanks for, yeah, thank, thank you, and thank you to keep up. Okay, so, and I'll come here, thank you, the floor is yours. Interesting, I was saying this uh, earlier to uh, Marina that uh, I already know almost everyone who's sitting here, which is a nice setting to giving a talk to know almost everyone. So, uh, no performance. So, I decided instead of reading from uh, like reading a text, that I'm going to actually read about the text or talk actually. Just go through points, and maybe at certain points I'll need your help to continue the talk. Maybe not to see. But let me know when technically uh, I could start. I can't do, but are you sure about the microphone? Don't you need it? Because I mean, I mean, is it, is it, it they need microphone. Is it possible? I mean, I, I don't mind using a microphone. Okay. If you cannot hear me, then yeah. Yeah, I guess because of the. Yes. Hello. Hello? Yeah, it's better this way. Yeah. Can everybody can hear me this way? Yeah? Oh, oh. Reading again through, um, because everyone was supposed to submit an abstract about the talk or the lecture that will be given, so I decided this morning, while uh, having breakfast, to read what I wrote. And it's, uh, so it is burn after hearing. And then I wanted to talk about memory politics, and I wanted to talk about the Arabic-speaking region, and Egypt specifically, in relation to the cultural scene. 
a police state, fundamentalist Islam, the role of the curator, and many other things. So, um, there's an Egyptian artist, a video artist called Noura Farahat, who had uh, a problem going out during the demonstration days, the intense first uh, few days, with a camera. So for a whole year, she would just go out demonstrating like everybody else who felt compelled to be on the streets but without a camera because she felt it would separate her from the event and holding the camera in her hand as an object would imme immediately put her in another position that she was not sure she wants to, to have or another feeling of her body in the space that she was not sure she was ready for. Yet on the 17th of December 2011, it was the first and the only day that she went out with a camera on Tahrir. Uh, and here I would like actually to play uh, the video called Archive, a video shot by Noura Farahat on uh, a side street of Tahrir Square, the 17th of December. <laughs> decide then not to go out again with the camera on the square. Um, this was shot on the side street from Tahrir where the Egyptian Institute or the, the Scientific Society of Egypt, also known as l'Institut d'Egypte, was being set on fire, 17th of December 2011. L'Institut d'Egypte was established 1798 in Egypt and the first director for it was uh, Gaspard Monge, who was the, the president who is also the, the founder of what we know as descriptive geometry, which is the, the science that then led to technical drawing and technical design. Uh, the director of the literature and arts at the Institut d'Egypte at the time was uh, Denon, who later, after serving in Egypt, became the first director of the Musée du Louvre in Paris. The institute was established by Napoleon Bonaparte and it was the largest scientific society outside of France. Burnt in, the, in December 2011, 17th of December, entirely burnt, except for a few books that were saved. Not a few, I mean, 200,000 books or something like this. But for an institute that had gems and, and historical documents, the 20 volumes of the description of Egypt were entirely burnt. The atlas of Lower and Upper Egypt was entirely burnt. The Atlas of Ancient Indian Arts was entirely burnt, among many other books and volumes and documents that were lost on that evening. This uh, was not the first time that it, something in Egypt with this uh, importance and with a collection as uh, relevant to heritage of the country and of the region, but also towards heritage in general, would be set on fire. Before I continue, I would like to see the, the second video, please.
moment and then it's, it's replayed again is that uh, so she, she had this decision that she does not want to go out filming because it would put her immediately in another position of being and of seeing and then almost a year after when when this was happening she felt compelled to be on the street with a camera because someone should be documenting what is happening which until now is not clear exactly what happened we know that a building was set on fire many historical collections were lost forever a few that were saved uh, are basically buried in the vaults of the National Archives, and I'm going to be talking about this shortly. Uh, we were not sure who was setting the building on fire. There were all sorts of actors from that performance who were present, but it was quite mysterious. So there was the military officers who were there throwing books back at us. So whenever we collect books and save them, they would actually throw them from the window or from the tree, as you saw. There were also the special forces, like the, the man was speaking earlier, who could have intervened uh, to stop the fire, whether by entering and arresting whoever was, was uh, setting the place on fire, or by sending the fire brigades to just extinguish it. There were many uh, security forces, there were ambulances, there were all sorts of, of possibilities of saving this institution, but it was very clear that this was meant to happen. So the fact that this was uh, supposed to happen, makes one wonder what kind of meaning they wanted to produce by this gesture or what they were trying to, to, to produce as an effect, what were they trying to do, literally. Yet what I find interesting here is that uh, you see all this green laser that became the, the best-selling uh, tool in the Egyptian revolution and lately is becoming very annoying to helicopters. But uh, people were pointing whenever they saw a police officer, uh, an army officer or someone who is in the institute and is whether throwing a Molotov cocktail or throwing books. So they were pointing at them. And at a certain point, the filmmaker pointed at someone and the friend with her next to her also pointed. And what happens, which you see right now, is that they decided to set the filmmaker herself on fire. So what happens is that she gets engulfed by fire this is when the image completely turns white. Could you please paint? We saw the video a few days after and just asked her what so how were you actually on fire and she was uh, her, she was wearing a, like a jacket with a hood and all of this was set on fire and they tried to uh, to save her the way that we also see earlier in the video when they went and tried to extinguish another uh, person who had his clothes on fire so apparently it was uh, it was very intense and it was also very possible to to still carry the camera and continue and be uh, extinguished in any moment. She stopped taking the camera and going out to, to film because to her it was very clear that she really went into that position of, of the, the a very embodied witness to what was happening and, and, and at the same time very distant because of the camera. Distant enough that she was being set on fire and she still would not have the normal reaction but actually was still trying to hold on to the camera. Uh, 
When it was burnt, what happened that night is a lot of activists tried to go to the place to collect as many books as, as, as possible. And then there was the question of what do we do? Because it is very clear that we are now part, whoever was there is part of this performance, is part of a state decision, clearly a state decision, that this building has to be burnt. Uh, if you would just open the PDF file, please. So we formed, uh, together with a few uh, random activists and artists and, and scholars, uh, a, a group of people to just go and collect the books. And uh, we ordered a few big trucks. We started uh, fighting with the, with the military officers there. Of course, they came up with all sorts of reasons to prevent us from collecting the books that Oh, you are white, then you are a spy, because you're not Egyptian, what are you doing here? You're about to steal these books. Or, you're Egyptian and visibly looking like an Egyptian, what are you doing there? If you do not work with the Ministry of Culture, or the Ministry of Education, or the Ministry of Antiquities, then you do not have the right to enter this building or to save these books. So after so many conversations and arrests that would happen for 5-10 minutes, and then they would release you, and then you would go to the next checkpoint, and then it would happen again, and then this insanity and of course at the same time after many discussions to convince a lot of people that no you cannot take these books home this way you're not saving the books and no we will not allow anybody to take these books home the common decision was to take the books to the national archives and here this is a picture from underneath the national archives the national archives or Dar al Wathaq al Kutub is uh, one of the largest archival units in the Arabic speaking region and it hosts collections of uh, books, documents, artifacts, manuscripts that are uh, of, a, of a great value in relation to the political history of Egypt and of the region, not just in relation to arts and culture, but really in relation to everything, from maps to, uh, to agreements, to contracts, to documentation of, of crimes, particular crimes, and so on. Yet at the same time, the National Archives being a body of such an importance, uh, directly involved in the, in the forming and in the preservation of the memory of a certain uh, people at a certain place and at a certain time. And being uh, positioned in what has been described often, Egypt as a police state, and I'm going to speak also about that, there is a, a police station inside the National Archive. This police unit, the, the mere placement of it inside this institution is a direct announcement of the nature of the work of this archive. One does not need to read a mission statement on what this archive does if one has to go to an archive and first pass through a police station, sign in and sign out when you go, leave in your data, your ID number. This is not necessary if you're just going there to the outlet because they have a lot of uh, publications and you could just go and buy a subsidized book at the price of one or two pounds which is not even 20 or 30 euro cents. You don't need to do this if you're just on the consuming end. But if you're going to enter the archive and you're going to access the documents and you're going to deal with it as a researcher, then this is a very different story. Um, established in 1913 or around that period, uh, a security body was created in Egypt when Egypt was still under British mandate. In 1936, this security apparatus was reinvented and it was supposed to be dealing with the security of the people in Egypt. Like in any uh, country, a Ministry of Interior Affairs would be the equivalent. But it was a, a parallel body existing within the framework of a Ministry of Interior Affairs but continued to work as a as a separate entity that has its own director and its own direction. Continued throughout the 1952 military coup uh, led by President Nasser, which later was uh, named the Egyptian Revolution, 1952. And it's only until the time of President Sadat where it was named the State Security Apparatus. And the State Security Apparatus, uh, which is also known in Arabic as Amn al Clearly from the name, it is about the security of the state, rather than that of the people. So this uh, separation was interesting to happen at that period. The state security apparatus controlled and collected information dealing with everyday life 
from uh, posters announcing the opening of a, of a new restaurant to the program of a cultural venue. The state security apparatus continued to exist within the The state security apparatus continued to exist within the Mubarak uh, period and in a way is still existing now. It constantly gets renamed and reinvented. So at a certain point it was named the, the security of the people and then the security of the homeland. And, but of course we know it is the state security. Very interesting uh, to think of two facts about the state security. Number one is that it always worked closely with the fundamentalist Islamist groups in Egypt whether directly against them by mass arrests and crackdowns on their secret cells, or with them by staging performances of violence or attacks or terrorist attacks on certain areas in order to fortify the security apparatus and give legitimacy to extending its arms into the core uh, strata of the Egyptian society and sustaining a certain uh, illusion of the need that, yes, we as a people do need the state security apparatus. It was during the period of Sadat that the state security evolved beyond uh, control, one would say, eventually having its own massive fortress in the area called Nasr city, continued to play closely with the Muslim Brotherhood specifically and the, the Islamist groups where Sadat was trying to use this as much as he can to end a lot of the, of the opposition and uh, specifically the, the socialist uh, parties and the socialist political movements just to fortify his own uh, party which later on continued uh, in this process of fortification under Mubarak, the National Democratic Party. Worth mentioning though is that on the 6th of October 1981, President Sadat was in Nasr city, the neighborhood that has the state security, the fortress that he built. And while uh, celebrating the day of victory, 6th of October, Sadat was murdered uh, there in this neighborhood by members of the Islamist groups that he was playing with through this state apparatus. Now we go again into uh, out of this tangent and we think of the Cairo Opera House that was built by Khidir Ismail in the 1800s, 1871 specifically. And it was uh, celebrating the uh, establishment of the Suez Canal, and it was an opera house that commissioned uh, pieces such as uh, Aida by Verdi, for example, and it witnessed the premiere of Rigoletto. The Cairo Opera House was burnt 1971. The Cairo Opera House was burnt completely and it existed on the square called Da'ataba. Worth mentioning is that right across the street from the Cairo Opera House is the main headquarters for the firefighters. The National Theatre of Egypt was built 1869 and uh, it was celebrated for its magnificent dome that was uh, from the inside, covered entirely by antique velvet and uh, hand embroideries, and it also hosted a collection of manuscripts, original texts written by playwrights, as well as original costumes of, of, of historical premieres of pieces. In 27th of December 2008, the National Theatre was set on fire, with those artifacts completely burnt and lost. The National Theatre of Egypt, or Al-Masrah Al-Qawmi, is on Ataba Square, right opposite the headquarters of the firefighters. The Bani Suif Theatre is also an example, which was uh, witnessing a radical performance of ritual theatre by um, the theatre director and Egypt's uh, only uh, theatre historian who decided to document ritual theatre in Egypt and its impact on modern and contemporary theatre in the Arab world working with a lot of pagan uh, rituals and animus rituals. And uh, Saleh Saad, in one of his performances in the Bani Suave Theatre, only eight years ago, the whole theatre was set on fire, supposedly accidentally, according to the press reports. Everyone was locked in, the doors were locked from the outside, and everybody died. The... The list goes back as far as the burning of Bibliotheca Alexandrina, 
centuries ago. The list is also not exclusive to Egypt, that of burning. One remembers many examples, whether in Baghdad or whether Kristallnacht, the list is quite long. I would like to go back to the moment of the establishment of the new Cairo Opera House, which is in 1989, under President Mubarak. So now the National Democratic Party has become the only party ruling Egypt, one could say, or 95%. Where Mubarak was winning elections by 99.8%, so there's practically no opposition, everybody wanted Mubarak. And the Amnid Dawla, or the state security apparatus, was also at its best. And this is where really one could describe it as a police state. The new Cairo Opera House hosted the Palace of the Arts. It also hosted the Artistic Creativity Center, which is the place that had a theater school, that had the modern dance school, which is where I studied. The complex of the new Cairo Opera House also hosted the Hanegar Theater, which is an independent uh, theater space even though existing within the Ministry of Culture, but it's supposed to give independence to people working in the cultural field and allow independent companies to come and show their work there. Uh, so they do not uh, have to belong to a particular syndicate in order to use state theaters. So what is the story about independent and not independent? Before Nasser, the cultural scene in Egypt was mainly run by the philanthropic community. It was... Uh, if there was a theatre company, it was privately owned. There was nothing as a state-owned uh, company. Even when the Royal Opera House was established, the Khedivian Opera House in the 1870s, or before this, when the Theatre of Azbakeya was established in the 1700s, and we're just going to talk about that part uh, rather than go further back in history. But in this period, it was mainly private companies showing work uh, that is written for these houses by companies that are resident companies in these houses, or inviting companies. So the Esbaquet Theatre was famous for its collaborations with the Comédie Française, for example, from France. The Royal Opera House was famous for working often with La Scala uh, from Milan. And uh, those uh, theatres continued to exist that way, where any Egyptian artist would have the right to go and create a piece. Of course, you have to make it worth their while so that your work is shown, or you have to be collaborating with a big star, the usual. Until the 1952 coup, when Nasser had uh, the idea of nationalizing Egypt, including culture. And this was the birth of the nationalist, uh, pan-Arabist, Nasser project, which had uh, at its core a uh, development uh, site, where he reinvented the cultural scene, one would say uh, pretty close to uh, a Soviet model at uh, later, in the beginning of the 60s, and reinvented everything from the Cairo Opera House to the archives to the National Academy of the Arts to the Conservatoire of Ballet, everything was reinvented in terms of the cultural sector where you had to belong to a syndicate in order to perform. You no longer have the right to just happen to be an artist and go and use a public theater or a public gallery or show your work. In the beginning of this era, it was wonderful for the artists because it meant a lot of support to their work. But of course, it also meant complying with a certain propagandist practice. If you are pro the Nasserist project, if you are a pan-Arabist, if you believe in the union of all Arab countries, then of course you are part of this project. If you happen to not fall under these categories, then you are not part of this project. The regulations and the rules kept getting uh, much tighter. And with the decline of the Nasser project, uh, mainly with his death, which is also argued to be a murder rather than just a death, and with the beginning of the Sadat era, which is also the rise of two things mainly, it is the state security apparatus, and it's also the, the, the rise of what he called al-infitah, which is the open market practices. With the rise of those two uh, projects of Sadat, what happened is that there was clearly a gap. You have a system that was established that was created because of a certain political ideology and this system has become obsolete now that the ideology is no longer there and now that the communist and the social parties are being eradicated by Nasser 
and this part of the people's memory is being erased at a very quick speed and the alliances are shifting suddenly from the east where it was with the, with the, the Soviet uh, Union but also with, with the Arab world and also with uh, capitals such as Jakarta or with, uh, even with India and the alliance of Egypt and its map was just shifting west so it was more with the states this was the beginning of uh, years and years of, uh, of American uh, involvement and the West in general. With this shift, you have a system that was established and modeled in a certain way that created links to certain countries and certain cultural institutions and that if you just limit the, the, the discussion to the cultural world. And suddenly you just leave the system as it is with all its foundations, infrastructure, and then you shift ideology, you abolish another ideology and you realign yourself with another part of the world. Suddenly the system started to eat itself and it became just bureaucracy for the sake of bureaucracy with laws increasing more and more, censorship rising because of the Amn al-Dawla, the state security structure and the taxes becoming radically different if you are an independent artist which means you do not work with the state and you're not sponsored by the state you have to pay much more, you do not have the right to use the state later and so on. With the end of the Sadat period and the beginning of the Mubarak period the Cairo Opera House in 1989 was established as a, architecturally it was a, a, a beautiful project collaboratively conceived by Japanese uh, architects together with uh, some Egyptian motifs from Egyptian architecture so it was supposed to be a collaboration on the visual and architectural side but not in terms of culture and policy which is also very interesting. Yet what was uh, surprising is Mubarak's decision that the two bodies that should be mainly dealing with the, with the Cairo Opera House other than the Ministry of Culture, which is the... one could say is playing the role of both the producer of content and also the, 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 the curator of events. So most of the curators of the, the artistic events that happen at the Opera House the festivals, the, the theatre programs are, of course, people working full-time as employees within the Ministry of Culture. What was interesting is that Mubarak's decision was that Amn al-Dawla, state security, together with the army, would be in charge of the Cairo Opera House. So the security that runs uh, the simple things such as the gates, uh, the people who stand to let you in, even in certain cases the ushering, are people working for state security. And at the same time, the high officials who would be in charge of, for instance, the position of director of Cairo Opera House, for the many years where I was uh, within the structure of the Cairo Opera House, as a student first and then as an artist working there, the director was uh, a high official in the military, who used to be the governor of Luxor before becoming the head of the Cairo Opera House. So this was again another clear statement, the way that there is a police station inside the National Archives, there were state security officers, as well as army high officials running the Cairo Opera House. The distance between the independent art scene, which was uh, more and more uh, um, crystallized during the late 1970s, this distance between the independent art scene, which is everything that is happening outside of this context, grew wider and wider to the extent that artists on both ends now do not even know one another, do not know the venues. So it is very uh, normal if you ask an artist who works in the downtown art scene, the so-called downtown art scene, which is quite relatively small, they would not know about the opening of a very important show of an artist from the 60s in one of the state-run palaces of the art, which is how they call their big galleries. What's interesting also is that uh, one finds it very problematic to see all of this while at the same time reading whenever there's an opening of a festival, curator of the festival, so and so, or uh, commissioned by, and then you have a name, whoever is commissioning this exhibition. I don't have to wonder, but I would like to say, I wonder how does it operate within the system that you actually curate. I don't have to wonder because many times I, I, I was confronted by what it is actually to meet a curator from this scene, what it is to try to access these archives, what it is to try to work at the music library, what it is to study in the Cairo Opera House. 
the examples to to uh, to um, to explain to you a bit more the role of the curator here or the role of the director of the festival or the director of the theater are quite uh, colorful, one must say. For instance, uh, the performance uh, in 2009 by Dalia Al-Abd, the Egyptian choreographer who was based in New York uh, and focuses mainly on Graham technique transported into contemporary dance practices was reported to the Egyptian police, given that it is so easy to do this at the Cairo Opera House if you have a performance with the state security being there, was reported by the cultural representatives of the so-called independent theater, the Hanegr, on the day of her premiere. And while the audience was there and already they had purchased their tickets and she was about to open, the backstage was flooded by police officers, something like 20, 25 police officers who insisted that the show must be stopped because she had not sent her text even though there was only like five, six words in a one hour dance performance that she had not submitted her text neither to the syndicate of, of, uh, of, of theatre or the house of production of theatre nor to the censorship departments therefore she is not allowed to perform what happened there is uh, just uh, pure luck that the audience heard that the police is backstage, so audiences flooded the backstage and they went and asked for their money back for the tickets from these police officers. They said, we don't mind you stopping it, just pay us for our tickets, which the police officers refused to do, and then the audience members then insisted that they have to see the show. And she performed only that one night and then they cancelled the show that it took months for her to produce. Another uh, case is of Laila Suleiman, the theatre maker, who was uh, just two days before the performance, already after having her poster sprinted out, forced to change the title of her performance because it referenced the state security and she's not allowed to. And instead of saying uh, at your own service or something like this, which is reminiscent of, of the slogan of the old uh, police uh, body, she had to just use one word or two words so it becomes this absurd title that is completely meaningless. The music library, the, the man in charge of the collections, who is curating collections on everything that happens in terms of live performance on theatres of the, of the state theatres in Cairo, refused, and this is his own decision, but of course it is within a certain system, so we know it is also the system's decision, refused to allow access to this collection. So for instance, in 2004, I produced a solo called High Voltage that was premiered at the Cairo Opera House. Later, a few years after that, I realized that the copy that I have of the, of the documentation was not uh, well shot, and I know that the Cairo Opera House filmed with many cameras. I go there asking to have a copy of my own performance, and they refuse, because I don't have the right, because I'm not part of the system, because he has orders, the reasons are plenty. Then I asked him to just merely sit and watch it there in one of the cabins that they have, and they also refused. After having paid the ticket, because one pays a ticket to enter the library, again, very cheap, but just to formalize it more and make it more and more uh, inaccessible. The National Archives, that night of the 17th of December 2011, when we were submitting, uh, when we thought we, ha we should submit the books that we had collected into the belly of the whale, uh, that we saw with these women wearing white gowns. That day after collecting everything, we were faced by a system... Um, there are two ways of thinking about it. We were faced by a short circuit within the system, or we short-circuited the system because they were trying to burn the books, we put the books on trucks, we jumped inside the building, collected the stuff, and now we said it is ready to be transported. Of course, this doesn't work with the dramaturgy of this higher performance that was being staged. It's interesting, this use of fire as uh, one could draw uh, a theatrical uh, comparison as a deus ex machina. What do we do now? We don't know what to do, just set the building on fire. And you set the building on fire, but of course fire also has a mind of its own because it either destroys the building entirely or it turns it into an, 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 an edifice of destruction like the case of the, of the L'Institut d'Egypte, which then remained from inside completely burnt out, from the outside because of the inside is a wooden structure and from the outside it's a stone stu a structure. It really remained looking like, uh, 
catastrophic. I mean, it's not, it has not burned down to ashes. It's just standing there to remind you constantly of this event, which I think in that case what, what was the meaning that was being produced. It was the easiest way to cover up for so many volumes that have been sold in the black market of uh, very historically relevant documents. And as I stood there that night with a curator, a book curator from, uh, from Belgium, and he said, don't worry, most of the important books are already now owned by NSGB branch, and I don't know where in Switzerland, and HSBC, and I don't know, he was like comforting me that I shouldn't worry because these books have already been sold black market a long time ago. So they exist in happier contexts, probably in a humidity controlled rooms as well. And I was just standing there watching the building being set on fire. I'm supposed to be um, but at the same time, it wasn't just the perfect way to cover up for the fact that these books have already been sold and that this culture was, uh, that this access, the access to this cultural heritage body has been made more and more difficult, but also to incriminate the revolutionaries and demonstrators on the streets. It was the easiest way you would go and set this building on fire, nobody knows who did it. The easiest press statement would be that this is the fault of the demonstrators. And on television, the official account of the SCAF, the Supreme Council of Armed Forces that was ruling Egypt at the time that this was happening. Next morning, what was literally said is that this was done by the protesters, and they deserve not just to be shot at, they deserve to be put in Hitler's furnaces. This was an official statement by Mr. Kato, who is now facing charges of being pro-Nazi. I don't know if the case is resolved or not. Um, I wanted to go from there, from this discussion, to something else in relation to the, the, the archives. Because it was very interesting when you are looking at these half burnt books, some of them dating to the 1700s or the 1800s, so there are already pages that are very tired and exhausted. They are probably full of dust, which means they can also completely rot in a second if they're wet, and of course they were wet because we were trying to extinguish everything. We collect them, we're standing there, and then suddenly there's a co-author improvising within somebody's performance. No, you are not going to set this on fire, we're going to transport these books. We stand there, and there were the police officers, and the police officers refused to let us move these books because these are books belonging to national heritage, and we don't know where you're going to take these books. What we decided to do collectively, after the advice of a completely and entirely insane war journalist who happened to be with us on site, an Egyptian woman by the name of Maryam Sami, who said, let's go and convince the police that we are thieves, that we are actually stealing trucks of books, and that they should arrest us, confiscate these books, take us to the National Archives because it has a police station, and they deliver us to the police, and then we handle it once we know. So we actually did that. We did this fantastic performance of being criminals. We went to the police officers and were like, please take the, the ID cards. We are willingly giving you ourselves and our ID cards. This is evidence, so you should confiscate it. You should also put us in these trucks, ride the trucks with us, because there was also the fear that if we just give them the trucks, they would just go and drown them in the Nile. You know, I mean, if they are so willingly adamant on destroying these books, you don't know what's going to happen if they just have the trucks full of these books. And they followed through. So we get into the trucks with them after giving them our national IDs. We go with the trucks at 3 in the morning or something like this. We arrive to the National Archives building. We convince them to open the doors. Of course, they don't want to open the doors. But then we were plenty, so they opened the doors. We go in, and then it was yards and yards of, of, of books in the garden. We were trying to dry them as much as we can, calling anyone we know who could open the storage of, I don't know where, that has blotting paper so that we dry them, or plastic so that we wrap them, or a vacuum seeding machine, and so on. 48 hours, everybody who was there was just going back and forth between both buildings, seeing if all books were, were taken out of the building, if the process of saving the books is still continuing there. Everybody at the archives knew every one of the activists by face, by name, by national ID number, because we had submitted our numbers of uh, our national ID cards as we were entering. 48 hours of this, calling each other by the name. One day later, nobody remembers us. We go there to make sure that the books are safe, that they are in their vaults, that they're going to start the process of um, reconstruction. And they say they don't know who we are. None of us were identified. 25, 27 people, none of us were identified. 
Even though we, we, we still remember them by name, we have pictures of them, we're like, this, this is me and Julia. Just three days ago in the garden here with a mess of books and... And you prevented me from taking a picture of this book because you said, why are you taking a picture? And I told you just to remember that this glorious book, I held it in my hands and you said, no, you shouldn't show anyone these pictures. No, no, we don't remember you. This didn't happen. You didn't come here. Somebody saved the books, yes, of course, but it's not me. Somebody did. Of course, we knew that the books were not going in the process of reconstruction, but again, it was interesting how memory becomes a site of uh, intense political work where the director of the, of the museum, uh, of, the, of the archives, announces officially that something like 80% or more than that of the books have been restored in like four weeks' time, which is impossible. To anyone who was there and to anyone who has seen these books or seen the pictures, it is entirely impossible. Then we knew that what we've done is basically burying these books, so taking them from a place that was being set on fire to bury them under the National Archives rather than put them in the National Archives. Which is the case with a lot of documents and with a lot of, uh, of artifacts in the National Archives. And here I find it uh, very interesting that when uh, Morsi, President Morsi, ex-President Morsi, hallelujah, was uh, changing the Ministry of Culture, and the Minister of Culture changed, and then the first thing that the Minister of the New Minister of Culture did was change the directors of everything, from the, the dance to the fine arts, but also to the archives. Of course, they suddenly realized that there are very crucial documents of the past 80 years of uh, criminal records in Egypt that needs restoration and recataloging. So this collection of very important 80 years of criminal history are suddenly taken to be recatalogued. Of course, we know that the Muslim Brotherhood also existed for 80 years, basically the past 80 years. In Egypt. So with these, um, with one regime falling and another coming, with the socialist Nasserist project failing or being, uh, uh, yeah, put on hold or stopped by the Sadat one. There's so that one ending by an assassination, Mubarak comes and the state security. It ends and the Muslim Brotherhood come after an interim period with the military. And the Muslim Brotherhood sort of believe that they are continuing now, but then nobody knows who is running and everybody else thinks it's the military, but it's a total mess. But anyway, with this constant change of regimes in Egypt, it is very interesting that the role of theater, the director of a theater, or director of a museum, or the collector of the music library, or the role of the director of the National Archives has not changed. That it was always, over this period of 60 years, more or less, is a very political role, is mainly dealing directly with the security apparatus, whether by fortifying it, or by erasing its memory, like the case with the Muslim Brotherhood when they took over, whether by burning documents or hiding documents, making it much more difficult to access the collections and the libraries. And I wonder, this is where uh, one raises the question, if this role, how clearly uh, understood it is, almost as if in the job description this is what's written when you go to apply for this job, I wonder if this was born uh, within the Nasserist project during the period of this hegemony on, on culture as a whole and the state, or because of the failure of, uh, on, on a, not on an ideological level, but really the failure on the level of that dream, the collective dream of the people that the country is ours, everything is ours, and this dream of re owning your own country after years and years and years of colonialist. Uh,